All right, so the root of all this is really encryption. So I'm gonna go back kind of to the beginning and discuss how encryption works and what it, how it's based on certificates. So the key to modern encryption is it's this asymmetrical encryption. And it's the notion that you can have two keys and they reverse each other, but they can't be used kind of in reverse of themselves. So if you have a key that does encryption, it's asymmetrical friend can do the decryption. And if I encrypt it, with the first key, the first key can't decrypt it, only the second key can decrypt it. And actually the way it works out, it turns out the reverse is true. If I encrypt with the second key, only the first key can decrypt with it. So you kind of have this relationship where two parties can talk to each other um, using this encryption method. In TLS or in link level encryption, encryption in transit, what you tend to do is you encrypt data with a, what they call a public key. So everybody is allowed to send data using this public key. And then the second key, which does the decryption, in this case, they make private. So nobody else can decrypt it except somebody who has the private key. So they're really important, right? So anybody on the internet can send you encrypted data, but you're the only can, one that can read what they said. Assuming there's no federal backdoor, right? So the private keys in these situations have to really be protected, right? Because everybody has access to what they call the public key but only you or the server itself has access to the private key. So it's the only one that can actually see what was sent to it. So the way this works at kind of a high level is the client connects to the server and it says, hey, what's your public certificate? When it gets the public certificate back from the server and the public certificate actually contains the encryption, public encryption key, it will go out to the CA, which I'll talk about later, and it'll verify that certificate is actually valid. If that if that certificate authority then tells you that the certificate is valid, it hasn't been expired, it's not been stolen, um, and it's actually was issued by that identity, uh, that entity, then what will happen is the client will then encrypt data with that public key. And now even the client can't decrypt it because it doesn't have the private key. The client will shovel that off to the server where the server will decrypt it. And then what actually happens is the client send its own public key across. Um, the server will reply and it'll actually reply with encrypted data. Right. And so the two of them will have exchanged their public keys at a high level and they can encrypt data back and forth to each other and only they can listen. So that's really the root of it. Uh, there's kind of this one funky subtlety is uh, the other way you can do this is you can if you want to sign something for like document signing. Uh, this was what the proposal was a while back. And this is actually how it works. You can actually take the private key, like your private key, and you can and you wouldn't use the same keys you use on the servers. You can take your private key and you can actually sign something. And then everybody on the internet can decrypt that signature and they know that you signed it because you're the only one with that private key, whereas everybody else has the public key to decrypt. So in all of this, the totally important thing that will freak your security people out is the private keys must be protected at all costs. I talked about this before, encryption relies, or TLS relies on certificates and certificates are really a bundling method, uh, method for certificates, I'm sorry, certificates are a bundling method for keys. So what happens is certificates contain the keys and the certificates are bound to host names. So when a certificate is issued, the signing authority, the one that issues the keys actually embeds the host name in it. And that makes it where some other host can't spoof you um, because their host name won't match the name that's in the certificate. And you'll see that occasionally you'll see somebody's DNS is expired or they move their code to a new machine and there's, you get these weird messages that say the certificate doesn't match the host name. So certificates can have wildcards. So you could do like star.yahoo.com or something, or you could do like subdomains. You could do star.qa.mycompany.com. So you got to really protect those because if you have a wildcarded cert, you could actually install that on multiple servers as long as they're all within the same subdomain or then the domain at the wildcard level matches. So some companies will actually forbid wildcard certs because they're risky and they can let people do extra servers that the company might not have approved. And some places like wildcards, there's a cost savings in that at some level if you're paying for certs. So we'll, that's not part of this discussion. We'll talk about it some other time. So the thing to remember is anybody with that host private cert can cough themselves up as that server using the public and then they can decrypt the traffic. So you got to make sure that you protect those private certs because otherwise anybody can be that become that host. 
So one of the things that's important to realize is certificates are issued. So I made a key and then I installed it on the server and they are static, right? They are, they build them and when you provision the server or you issue the DNS, you go in and create that certificate. And they're bound to a particular host name or a wildcarded host name. So the place this really comes into play is in the cloud, if you have auto scale groups or any type of auto growth management, new servers actually get in cloud. what happens a lot of times is nodes are actually created with dynamic names that are kind of dependent on the cloud provider. So they don't actually have like mycompany.com DNS entries, right? For the auto scale names. So you, you could do it with uh, like a, you could do dynamic DNS where, so I have a two node cluster and I had a third node and the first two were a dot my app dot my company dot com and you know b dot my app dot company dot com and the third node comes on is c dot my app dot company dot com and then what you could do is you could do a wild card for those guys but typically you have like so many nodes in your I'm like I'm working in a place now or the place I was at before and you know we probably had five thousand nodes or ten thousand nodes actually when we started we had a thousand within the first couple of months so what tends to happen is the certs don't really line up with all these auto scaling kind of things. So what you'll tend to see is certificates really get put on the load balancers, the kind of the public facing of a cluster. Um, and that'll be the place you issued your cert. That'll have the right domain name. And then the rest of the nodes on the inside will have some kind of crazy dynamically generated names. And in those cases, what happens? Well, anyway, so you just got to be aware how that works, right? So. Cloud names are, names are dynamic. You can dynamically add more nodes. They can be destroyed and rebuilt. You're probably not going to create DNS entries for all, or for all of those C names or anything like that. The cloud will create DNS entries so you can find the nodes individually and they can be plugged into load balancers. But the net is you tend to manage your certs at the load balancer level and then you let the cloud kind of manage any encryption or certificates on the dynamic nodes in its own way. And so sometimes you'll kind of, well, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but the thing that ma the main thing to remember is when you do this on-prem, you kind of have very fixed environment. It's very easy to control the certificates in the cloud. You got to decide if you're, especially if you're going to do wildcard search. And if you're not, it can become very, very difficult to do support direct connections to some of these dynamic nodes. So a lot of times you'll run into a situation where really the only way to connect to those nodes um, when doing business work is through a load balancer. You might support backside communication for monitoring and logging, but that'll all be handled in some other way. So this is kind of long winded, but I just wanted to call out that you do see different behavior when you're in the cloud. Certificates really rely on a trust chain. Okay. So when you get a certificate, a public certificate from a server, when I browser connects, the certificate actually says, Hey, we're just going to do encryption. And if that's all you want, you don't have to do any trust things. You ignore who issued it. You're just using it for encryption. You're good to go. You'll see this a lot with self-signed certs. On the other hand, most application libraries and all browsers, when they get a certificate, they want to know, was this, is this certificate? Well, first they check the certificate. What's your expiry date? That's fine. And then they go to the certificate authority, the one that actually issued that certificate that kind of gave the passport out or gave the driver's license. They go out to those and they say, hey, is this thing still valid? They have to know, so, and then they have to trust that entity to actually be trustworthy. <laughs> so if, uh, you know, I don't want myhacker.com issuing certificates, I don't trust those guys, but I might trust Entrust or somebody. So it comes down, there's actually a list of companies or providers by default in most browsers. And as long as certificates are issued by them or their children, then you'll trust it. So what happens here, I'm going to look at this. When I'm in an app or a browser and I'm coming to a server, you know, I'm like, work with me, man. You know, I want to, I want you to do some data for me. That thing will actually give you back a cert. And the notion there is that it's saying, trust me, right? So you connected to me and you think you got the right server and you think I'm actually doing the right thing. I'm going to give you my cert and I want you to trust me. Well, the browsers and most apps don't actually naturally have trust. What they'll do is they'll, at, at the first level, they'll be like, was this signed by anybody I know? And if it's not signed by any of the trusted authorities, 
they'll actually reject it out of hand. And then if repudiation or, um, you know, where you can cancel a cert is involved, they'll actually go to that certificate authority and they'll be, hey, is this certificate still good? So, and the way that part works is in the browser, they will have a list of certificate authorities. You'll hear them called root CAs or root certificate authorities. And whenever a cert, they get a cert, um, they'll check to make sure that cert was issued by one of those root authorities or one of its trusted delegates. So here we have a root certificate and it's delegating trust to an intermediate certificate authority. And then when the browser gets a certificate from my server, it'll be like, dude, like who's your parent? And then they'll try and walk up the certificate, like going through the issues. It's kind of like if you were doing driver's licenses, right? The, your state you're in actually you know, the driver's license are trusted because they're authenticated or they're validated, they're supported by the state, they're backed by the state. But actually the individual offices in the state can actually issue driver's licenses. So those are kind of like delegated or intermediate driver's license authorities, right? So any driver's license issued in the state in one of the DMV offices is trusted because at a high level, you know that those, those are all audited and they're managed by the master driver's license DMV. And so therefore all the delegation works out, we trust the license, right? It's the same thing with certs. The main certificate authority doesn't have to issue all the certs, it only has to issue uh, proxies to enough intermediate authorities and then those intermediate authorities can actually, actually issue the cert. And whenever the browser gets a certificate, it's like, is this certificate issued by anybody I trust or any of their delegates? And that's how that works. So what you can do is you can ignore trust. If you only want to do encryption, then you can just ignore trust and you can be like anybody that gets a cert, I assume it's uh, issued by a company, even if I don't know who they are and I'll just use that for encryption. You won't use that on the internet, but you might use it internally. So in a lot of cases in the cloud, certificates will just be issued by machines or by infrastructure. And it may or may not have a trust chain. And it's really because you know it's issued in the server or in the cloud and you are really just using it for encryption. And what you might do is you might set up a pipe between two servers. The trust never manage, matters because what you did is you set up firewalls between those two servers. So server A knows that it can only ever talk to server B, therefore it doesn't have to check and verify that server B. And it's because the way the routing's set up, only those two machines can only talk to each other that way. That doesn't work on the internet, but it'll work on an internal data center. Talk a little bit, this is kind of redundant, certificate verification or repudiation. So basically trust relationships I mentioned before, browsers include their own trusted CAs and therefore they trust any of the intermediates or any of the children of those. So it's the DMV and the local DMV office. Windows actually includes its own trusted CA list. So actually when you're in an active directory structure or the different active directory nodes can push down or when machines are provisioned, the machines can inherit trust relationships. Um, so a lot of times browsers have trust and Windows machines have trust. Most code has no innate trust. There's no, uh, maybe in C Sharp on Windows, but, or in a .NET on Windows. But in most environments with a lot of the scripting languages or things on Linux machines, they have no innate trust. So a lot of times you have to install certificates. You have to install the, the trust relationship so that the code, when it gets a certificate, will actually trust the issuer. You'll see this in, um, like if you're doing Oracle databases and they do self-signed with the Oracle wallet, you actually have to install the War Oracle Trust certificates into your application so that when you connect to Oracle, you actually believe it's that Oracle database you're talking to, as an example. Boy, you can always tell what people are working on, right? Because those are the examples they use. Um, I think this repudiation and validation I kind of talked about already, browsers verify the certificates with the issuers. First thing they do is they verify that they trust the issuer, then they verify the certificate with the issuer that it's still valid. Um, code can do the same thing. So a lot of times you'll actually just Make sure you trust it, but most code, a lot of code doesn't actually go out and see if the certificate's been revoked, like stolen or expired, pre-expired in some way. And some cloud components don't do any of this. The, like I know that some of the load balancers in certain environments, if the certificates are self-signed with certain kind of foot fingerprint, they really don't validate it. They're just using it for encryption and they're assuming that the routing will take care of spoofing or any of the other piece.